Jack Vance, where have you been in my life? I recently got round to reading The Dying Earth, a classic of fantasy fiction which completely blew me away and which is such a colorful masterpiece of bizarre images and monsters all over the place and spells doing the most impossible things. It takes, it draws on some uh, genre tropes from preceding literature. It draws on the cosmic aliens of H.P. Lovecraft, on the bizarre fantasies of Lord Dunsany and the people influenced by him, and it weaves together this canvas that is so recognizable, it's, it's such a recognizable, a quintessentially, uh, a quintessential fantasy world, well, the, the Dying Earth, Jack Vance depicts in this novel, short story collection, in this book, because it was so influential on so much fantasy to come. In the original Player's Handbook by Gary Gygax, creator of Dungeons & Dragons, I think the guy included a list of reads uh, which were especially influential on him and on the imaginary he used in creating this fantasy game. And in that list was, of course, The Dying Earth by Jack Vance. And I don't think I can underestimate, I, I can overstate, sorry, I don't think I can overstate how seminal and how relevant this book and the world building in it was to contemporary fantasy in general, to Dungeons & Dragons itself, which would later go on to shape uh, the fantasy worlds of so many pieces of literature and uh, role-playing games, board games, whatever. The influence of Vance's world building on fantasy fiction to come is so major and so relevant and perceivable that had I read this book without knowing anything about the author, I would have said it was the work of someone who has played maybe a little bit too much Dungeons and Dragons or is a little bit too obsessed with those old Forgotten Realms uh, video games, Baldur's Gate, uh, Neverwinter Nights and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's wizards in here who can only memorize a certain amount of spells and the more powerful the, sm the spells the less um, the less amount they can memorize and commit to memory. There's innkeepers that are being tipped to gain knowledge of side quests. There's all sorts of colorful monsters doing the most absurd things. Plant, uh, plant animal hybrids, all those kinds of wacky monsters. This is such fun if you're into that kind of stuff, into, if you're into imaginative literature. I don't think this is only for fantasy fans. If you are a fantasy fan, by all means this is a classic, a must read, uh, but you probably don't need me to tell you that Jack Vance is a seminal fantasy writer. If you're not that interested in fantasy literature, you can still have a hell of a good time with this book just by exploring someone who can really tap into the, inner, the, the innermost power of words and into the power of sheer language to create these beautiful and imaginary and detailed worlds and realities. One of the reasons, and it's really very much a silly reason, why I'm not that hot about certain types of literary fiction, what is usually called slice-of-life fiction, is that it seems to me that when you can write, when you are a good writer and can write good fiction, you basically have access to the most, one of the most powerful tools in reality. You can really create all sorts of worlds and situations. And it's weird to me that people use that gift to tell others what happens outside their window. You know, they could look outside the fucking window and see by themselves. But it's not like those people are wrong. It's, uh, once more, it's just a silly thing that I occasionally think when I read the odd, dull, plotless uh, literary short story. But what can you do? Going back to this, the world building is so astonishing and so powerful that what happened when I started reading this book, I think I was on a bus, is that I read the first paragraph and it was all awesome, then I got to basically page three and I realized I was completely lost and I had no idea how I got there. I, I had basically moved from some, cast some guy's castle to a sort of Eden-like paradise, possibly in another dimension. Which is the same thing that happens with another masterpiece of world-building and imaginative fiction, which is The Crying of Lot 49 by Thomas Pynchon. Yes, this book is that relevant, it's that good, it has that same wacky vibe uh, and air of, uh, you know, you do feel that this is a guy that is playing with, uh, is marveling at his own powers of world building. Uh, the reason why I mentioned that, the reason why that happened is that this book moves at a break, breakneck speed. 
mostly because it's not really a novel. Everyone always sold me the book as a novel, but no, it's a collection of short stories, it is. Uh, and of course, short stories advance at a different pace, uh, and it's okay, completely fine for them to, you know, uh, revolutionize the plot in the span of a page. And that happens all the time in this book. Some of these stories are unforgettable, some of them are more conventional and have more predictable endings, but I'm not, I'm not really complaining. Each of them has its own strength, be it the description of a uh, or ritualistic Black Sabbath sort of orgy, be it a, a clever plot twist, be it some sort of very subtle political satire uh, that is completely fused together with the fantasy world building, each of these has its own strength as a collection, it's flawless. Except the one flaw I found in this book, and I am absolutely certain it may be just my problem, especially as a non-native English speaker, was that the lexicon of this thing was so tough at times, was so cryptic and obscure. I recently reviewed another classic of fantasy fiction, which is The Shadow of the Torturer by Gene Wolfe, and there too I complained about the lexicon of this book. But one thing someone said in the comments to my video that I absolutely 100% agree with is that The Shadow of the Torturer is full of obscure lexicon and the narrator keeps referring to monsters or institutions or social roles that you do not really know what you know, you don't really know what this stuff, what is a lictor, what is a uh, tetra fuck stop, who knows? But at the same time, Shadow of the Torturer teaches you as you go along, as you read the book, it teaches you about this world. And the complexity of the language is part of what makes the world building, world building brilliant. Um, Dying Earth? No, it's just that the lexicon is very hard and, you know, yeah. Uh, that that's it. it. It's full of very old old words, old words that are difficult to get, and that occasionally gets in the way of the fun. And I have to admit that I did not look all of these up, which meant that every once in a while I got across, I came across a paragraph where the main character is uh, doing a verb to a, a item, a uh, noun. So yeah, I still have no idea what he was doing there. But what can you do? Once more. Uh, Dying Earth, a pleasure to read, amazing. If you can stomach some obscure lexicon, some uh, cryptic terminology, the kind of stuff you would hear, you would overhear at uh, if you joined a role-playing game whose uh, context and whose world you were not familiar with. If all that stuff sounds interesting and fascinating to you rather than off-putting, you can have great, great fun with Jack Vance. Uh, I'll probably be reading soon The Eyes of the Overworld or of the Other World, which is the follow-up to The Dying Earth, uh, and maybe I'll let you know what I think, maybe I'll just uh, post a review, it depends if you guys care, uh, but let me know about your experience with Jack Vance, let me know what you think about him, I know he's a master of fantasy fiction, has so many fans, so influential as mentioned, and thank you as always for watching. In a second you'll find links on the screen to my review of The Shadow of the Torturer, and to another uh, video that has nothing to do with the stuff I'm talking about at the moment. If you like this video, consider subscribing, that will be great, and I'll see you in our next review. Bye guys!